um, you probably see me lying down here. <laughs> but um, welcome to the Dorchester, welcome to the chef's table. My name is Henry, I'm the executive chef here, overseeing yeah, nearly everything about her food and beverage on it. And unfortunately, you have to deal with me tonight. Did somebody explain to you what you're letting yourself in for tonight? <laughs> no? Completely, completely blank. Well, you stay blank. I won't tell you either. Right? It's a complete surprise what we're doing tonight. But it all, it all has to do, I can tell you that much, with food and wine matching. Or wine and food matching exercise. So, I guess you're all in the trade. You're all wine buffons. <laughs> you all have very uh, distinctive palettes. I hope I, I find out very quickly how distinctive your palette is, <laughs> actually. Uh, but the, the game today is actually to show you how wine can work with food. What actually makes it for, for the wine to influence some of the food ingredients. But also what makes it for the, um, for the food ingredients to influence the wine. And we have uh, quite a, a nice flight of, uh, of wines laid out for you from, yeah, from Novo Perrier, um, which all of the wines you should know, in and out, I guess. So maybe, maybe there is absolutely nothing to learn from your side, what but, but I, but I, but I've been doing. Yeah? Uh, but no, it is, it's, quite, it's quite interesting how a little nuance of an ingredient or how a wine, a bouquet of a wine, can actually change a complexity completely. And that is my job to show you tonight to how it can be done. Maybe it doesn't work for you at, uh, at all. Don't blame me, I know how my palette works. The mm -hmm. false is always on your side, I'm always right and you're wrong. End of story. Yeah? No, not really. Uh, you have something to say. I use you as guinea pigs tonight. Yeah? We try things out on you and see how it and see how it works. If any questions you have and I'm in the room, I'm more than happy to uh, to answer you. Depends what it is, of course. Uh, um, and yeah, if anything you want to know, then feel free. I will, do, I will interrupt you about six times tonight. I tell you quick about the wine, uh, a little bit. We have the specialists around there, yourself as well. And then also tell you how it actually, what's my philosophy behind it and, and how it should work on the palette. At the end of the day, it is your palette that makes all the difference. And all of you have very different palettes. There is not one palette aligned, which actually makes my job a little bit more interesting. Because if everybody would, would sense and taste the same thing, it would be a pretty boring life. And there. Yeah. yeah. So hopefully when you're going away tonight, you have a little bit of different understanding. Um, and if you do that, then I'm a, a very happy man. And if you don't get it, I'm still happy. <laughs> but less satisfied, say it that way. Okay. Shall we start? You ready? Perfect. Okay. Thank you. Let's go. So one, two, three, here we are. Wow. Wow. Perfect. Well, hello everyone. That was a lot easier this time because yeah. we have a lot smaller, more intimate table. Um, well, you know what? Thank you ever so much for all coming tonight. Um, I have to say, I, I went to an event at Coward Park. It was earlier on this year, wasn't it? Was it earlier on this year or yeah. last year? Yeah, it was earlier this year. It was That's earlier this year. Thing. And I met Alex and I met David, and tonight we have Adam as well. So David and Adam are the two directors at Lauren Perry in the UK. And at this particular event, I met up with David and I said, you know what, we must do an event with the Vino. And we must get some of our folks in the room and explore the champagnes that you have. Because in my mind, when it comes to Lauren Perrier, they, these are fam fabulous champagnes. And even more fabulous also when you put them with food. I mean, they're absolutely sensational. So I'm, I'm very happy that we've been able to do this today. And especially as it's going to be the last of this year, the last dinner that we've done, which makes it even more special for me. Um, and, and you, because it's not all just about me, is it? Um, so we have some fantastic. <laughs> I think I, I mean, I, I'm very privileged um, in, in my role with Vivino um, because I get to spend time with such wonderful people, and it's a unique role in that you are people who I can call my friends as well. 
Um, we share a lot in common, mainly wine, <laughs> amongst other things. <laughs> that it's a wonderful position to really be able to value the time in which we spend together. And, you know, we're a community, but collectively we're much more than that. We are friends. And that's something that I really embrace and, and I really value. So today what we're gonna do is try some absolutely fantastic champagnes from Laurent Perrier. And we have Adam who's gonna run through each of them with us when the course has come out. But, I guess on that note, before I sit down, I, I just want to end this year saying not only a big thank you to Alex and Adam for coming along today and sharing their wonderful wines with us and allowing us to eat in this fantastic venue, but also a thank you to you guys as well, because without you, the Vivino, you know, it wouldn't be what it is. And so you keep the cogs turning, you keep helping people explore wines, and together we're changing the world of wine as we know it. So, thank you ever so much. I'm going to sit down and hand you over to Adam. Sure, absolutely. So, as Adrian says, then I'll stand up as uh, each wine is brought out to say a little, about, a little bit about each wine. But uh, I did want to make sure that I said something about Laurent Perrier's brand story. I know that with uh, an audience of people who are tasting quite as many hundreds and thousands of wines as as uh, each of the people here, then I'm sure you already know uh, quite a bit about Warren Perrier, but I just wanted to say something so that we had a common ground in terms of the brand story, and then we can, uh, we can ask any more detailed questions afterwards. So, to me, the fascinating thing about Warren Perrier is that even though the history of the company goes back to 1812, it's really a story of modern renaissance. In 1945, when Bernard de Manacor inherited Laurent Perrier from his mother, it was the 80th biggest champagne brand, 8-0 biggest champagne brand. When he passed away in 2010, it was the third biggest champagne brand. So during his lifetime, a phenomenal change in the business occurred. When Bernard inherited the business, he realized that he wouldn't be able to change the business uh, by copying what the other champagne houses were doing. He realised that he had to take a different path. He had to challenge the conventional way of doing things in champagne. So he deliberately went about doing things differently so that the consumer could enjoy champagne in a better way. So what he did, he focused on two particular things. First of all, he looked at the Brut non-vintage champagne, which is the high volume sort of calling card champagne of every house, like, like, like you know. And he looked at, uh, uh, he felt that there was an opportunity to develop a style of champagne which was fresher, lighter, more elegant. The sort of champagne of which your palate wouldn't tire if you were drinking it uh, at a wedding, you know, all afternoon during a nice sunny day. At that time, then oak was very popular in production of champagne. And Bernard was the first person to throw away the oak and move into stainless steel for champagne, which really makes a big difference to the style. The second major thing which he did with his Cube Cube is he chose the least prevalent uh, grape in champagne, the Chardonnay grape, to be the grape which is the, which is the majority in our Cube. So 55% of our Brut non vintage, which we've just been drinking outside, is Chardonnay, whereas only 30% of the planted uh, area in Champagne is Chardonnay. So the combined effect of the stainless steel and the Chardonnay developed what, what he called a vin de plaisir, the sort of fresh, elegant Champagne which you can which you can drink without tiring your palate. So that's one of the key things which he did. The second thing which he did alongside that is he was very innovative with cuvées, which is great for dinners like this because we've got lots of uh, lovely cuvées to, uh, to, to, to drink through and experiment with, with uh, Henry's uh, food pairings. So he was the first person uh, in Champagne to develop a prestige cuvée made from multi-vintages. We'll talk more about it when we drink the wine, but the Grand Siècle wine is the first prestige cuvée which is multi-vintage. He was also the first person to develop a rosé champagne which had been done in a serious uh, in a serious way using the Sanier method, 1968 Sanier method rosé. In 1981 he was the first person to launch a serious uh, zero dosage champagne, the Ultra Brut, which we'll be drinking uh, 
as the next as the next one actually. And then in 1987, he was the first person to bring out a prestige cuvee rosé champagne. And there's a lovely story behind that, which we can talk about when we have the pleasure of drinking that wine. So he innovated across the cuvees, um, and he reinvigorated or he reinvented the brut non-vintage category for Laurent Perrier. So today, Laurent Perrier is still the largest independently owned champagne house. Our biggest competitor makes uh, handbags and other fashion items. We solely focus on champagne. We've got a consistency of style in the production of the champagnes, which is unrivaled. We're on the third cellar master since 1950. Quite amazing. And uh, obviously we uh, are chosen by some of the top uh, establishments in, the, in London and uh, other parts of the world, such as the Dorchester. So I'm looking forward to sharing some of our champagnes with you this evening. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, 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 you don't know what you're getting yourself into if you go. Our next course, we have some um, hand dive scallops from the Olympic Island. So I have six tables uh, working for me um, up in Scotland, we are, which are still delivering who they employ by the Dorchester, so they employ by me. Um, not by myself, but for the hotel. Um, <laughs> and uh, I buy for the restaurants, I, I only buy from them. Uh, scallops, lobster, langoustines. That's the only way for me to to can guarantee that I have on my shelf which is not longer or not older than 12 hours after catching. And that is very important for me because especially in the world in the scallops is freshness <coughs> of the ingredients. And there again, scallops, sweetness. I tone the sweetness down in two ways. First of all, with the alba truffle. The Alba truffle is quite pungent. It's very aromatic on the nose when it comes to flavor. Mm -hmm. Actually, it actually disintegrates very quickly in anything in the food. And then secondly, I put some crisp chicken skin on there because scallops, they love a meaty experience. I do, uh, I do a lot of recipe with working with veal. And uh, veal, I find a little bit too, um, not too common. I must say, especially when we're working with a wine like that, so the crisp chicken skin, it works together like toasted hazelnut, and that's exactly what we're getting out from the Alba truffle as well. And also have to be careful with the wine, because the wine is very delicate. Um, it's a wine where I cannot get too many powerful flavors onto it. But the sweetness of the scallops, underneath the risotto, a little bit of acidity, is I cook that with white onions and flavor that with a little bit of white chocolate. Mm -hmm. I keep the balance. It's very important to keep this balance right because in the wine you have a, a hint of sweetness onto the wine, a bit of wild strawberries on there, uh, quite a bit of fruitiness, but it's a soft, it's a soft one, it's a very delicate bouquet. And that is very important for me to keep creamy, to not bring in too many textures. And also I can I can bring some powerful flavors onto it because the wine is, can stand up to it, but I have to, to tone the powerful flavors from the ingredients down, and that's what they're doing with the chicken skin. Right? So there's, there is quite a lot going on in that dish. Um, you, the easiest way, have a sip of the wine, experience the impression of the wine, and then fight your way through, and you will see how the nuances of the wine is always changing. Without actually getting overpowered, and the wine is actually supporting the food, again, and actually lifting the natural flavors. That's the my philosophy. When I, when I um, designed that, uh, that style of dish for that wine. Um, but you, know, you are the judge. Enjoy. Thank you. Yeah. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> for every dish now, what will be so clap? You don't need to clap me. Anyway, so uh, there's a lovely story behind this wine if you don't already know it. So in 1987, this wine was, uh, was released and uh, it was produced by Bernard de Menancourt in secret and it was released at the wedding reception of his uh, daughter Alexandra so a special surprise which, uh, about which she had no idea so really made, uh, really, really made a special day for her I don't know what her other sister uh, kind of, uh, came to expect but uh, <laughs> uh, the father didn't release another cuvee he'd run out of ideas by the time Stephanie got married I think 
But uh, there's a technical point to be made in relation to the rosé here, I suppose. I, you probably know that Laurent Perrier is the only Grand Marc house which makes a Sanya Method uh, rosé. Both of our uh, rosés are Sanya Method. Um, so this particular one is 80% Pinot Noir, 20% Chardonnay. The non-vintage ro rosé that we've got is 100% Pinot Noir. In both cases, they're all 100% uh, Grand Cru uh, vineyards. Um, and in both cases, then, we use the Sanya method. Uh, so we, uh, we leave uh, on skins, in the case of this wine, for three days. So because we've got Pinot Noir and Chardonnay, the Chardonnay influence um, gives it, combined with the age, gives it that uh, unusual and distinctive amber color, which you see when you have the, uh, when you have the vintage rosé. It is a vintage. Um, and because we do the maceration of the Pinot Noir and the Chardonnay together, that means we can only make this wine in years where the Chardonnay and the Pinot Noir ripen to perfection at the same time. So that limits how many of these uh, wines we, we could ever do. This is the seventh release, it's 2004, so it's obviously been, uh, been, been around for some time, 10 years minimum. Uh, aging before disgorgement and uh, then it's released. So this is a really complex wine for a really complex dish. So I think we should have some fun experimenting with what we, uh, what we can get in this. So in 1959 when Bernard booked uh, this wine uh, forward, then the prestige cuvées in existence at that time were all vintages. And his conception was if you're going to have the pinnacle of your champagne, you want it to be perfect. <laughs> 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 but it's, it's fun, I mean, it's funny because my housemate, my wife is like A R E A R E M A R K. Nice, tarty, cleansing, and then gets you ready for yeah, the last few years. Oh, do do No, 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 it's fine. Yeah, it's soft. Now, now, there is. Well, it, again, yeah, but it depends. It depends the target model, the extra target model that you're trying to reach. Because.